Now that you've learned how to summarize your data using tables and graphs, this chapter discusses how to summarize your data using numbers. So central tendency is all about trying to find a single score which defines the center of the distribution. And this score, or a set of scores, is supposed to represent all numbers in the data set. And today, you're going to learn about the mean, the median, and the mode, the three measures of central tendency. So just a summary of the topics that are going to be covered in this lecture. First, we will talk about the mean, which is the most commonly used measure of central tendency. Then I will talk about the weighted mean, which is an application of the mean when you're combining two different samples together. Then I'm going to talk about the median, which is just the midpoint of scores, and the mode, which is the most frequently occurring score or set of scores. And then finally, I'll tell you how to select the most appropriate measure of central tendency based on the scale of measurement and the shape of the distribution for your data. So the mean is just a fancy word for the average. We've all learned about the average in basic math. It's just taking the sum of all the scores and dividing it by the total number of scores. And you've had a bit of practice doing this already. Now there's two different symbols for the mean. For the sample mean, when you have a subset of the population of interest, M is the symbol for the mean. And you take, again, add all the scores together, divide by the total number of scores. So the sum of X divided by N, sum of all the scores divided by the sample size. The population mean is symbolized as mu, this funky curly Q thing. And it equals, same thing as the sample mean, the sum of all the scores together, divided by the number of total scores. Or in other words, the sum of X divided by capital N, where this N represents the population size instead of this N up here that represents the sample size. So let me show you an example of calculating this with a frequency distribution. And you've had some practice doing this, but it doesn't hurt to show you again. So if you look here, we have some data looking at the number of semesters among all sophomore psychology students at NSC. And I'm calling this a population because it's all sophomore psychology students. And let's just say that that's the only group I'm actually interested in. So here is our frequency distribution table. Just as a review, one student has been here for 10 semesters, three for seven, 27 have been here for one semester. And if you add these F frequency values together, you'll see that in our population, I have a total of 51 students. So remember, in order to calculate the mean, you need to find the sum of x. And in this case, you can't just add up all the x's together. That just represents the range of scores, but not how many times those scores are present in our data. You have to take into account that we have 51 students, and we need to add up all their scores. So you take each x value and multiply it by each F value, or each number of semesters multiplied by how many students have been here that long. So 10 times 1 is 10, 9 times 0 is 0, 8 times 0 is 0, all the way down, and then you add that together to get the sum of X, which is the numerator of your mean formula. Then you just plug those values into the formula for the mean. See, this is a population, so we're using mu for our symbol. We're also using a capital N to rep represent the population size, the number of scores in our population. The sum of x is 126 divided by 51 scores, and we end up with a mean, population mean, of 2.471. Now, you may also be asked to calculate the mean using raw data that has not been placed into a frequency distribution table. And it's important for you to know how to do that as well. So let's say that I just want to look at the number of semesters um, that sophomore psychology students have been at an SC, but only among my students in my stats class. So let's say that I take a random sample of those stats students, and you'll see one person's been here for three semesters, one person's been here for two, and so on and so forth. The sample size is eight. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight scores. The sum of x is 14, and you can get that by literally just adding these scores together. Three plus two plus two plus two plus two plus one plus one plus one will give you 14. Then to find the mean, you just take the sum of x 
divided by n, lowercase n because we're talking about a sample size, and 14 divided by 8 will give you 1.75 for the sample mean. Now this is the population mean from before, the 2.471. And these two don't add up, so we have some serious sampling error going on here. Now, part of this sampling error could just be due to random chance. I took a random sample of my students. But there's also probably some sampling error that's systematic because I took a sample from a specific class, a convenient sample, if you will, of students that I personally had access to. But just in general, the sampling error is the difference between the sample mean and the population mean. These two do not match. So it's important for you to know how to find the sample size or the sum of all the scores using the mean formula when you don't have access to the raw data. So let's say that I tell you you have a sample with eight people in it. The mean for that sample is 1.75. What is the sum of x or what is the sum of all the scores? And you can find that based on n and m. So here's the process that you would go through to find that. And if you remember from algebra, if you do one thing to one side of the equal sign and you do the exact same thing to the other side of the equal sign, the overall value doesn't change, but you're able to simplify an equation so that it gives you the end result that you're looking for. So you start off with the mean formula, sum of x divided by n, sum of all the scores divided by the total number of scores. Well, we aren't happy with that. Right now, this is telling us what the mean equals. And we already know what the mean equals. And we also know what the sample size equals. We are trying to figure out this. So you just replace all these variables with the actual numbers that we have. So 1.75 is the mean. We don't know what the sum of x is, so we just leave it as a variable, divided by 8, which is our sample size. Well, now we are trying to isolate the sum of x by itself so that we have something that looks like sum of x equals whatever it is. So if we multiply both sides of this equation, both sides of the equal sign by 8, then we end up with the sum of x equals 1.75 times 8. And 1.75 times 8 is 14, and that is our sum of x. Now, if you're more comfortable with using a formula that starts off as a formula and then you can solve with it instead of this process, then I'll show you how you can derive a formula for the sum of x using the mean formula. So you start off with mean equals the sum of x divided by n, and then without replacing any of the variables with numbers, we can just multiply both sides by n, and we end up with the sum of x equals mn. So again, you multiply both sides by n to get rid of this dividing by n. We do the opposite of what's happening here. If we're dividing, then we multiply by that n to get rid of it. And if you multiply both sides with n by n, it disappears here, and it gets added to the other side. So again, sum of x equals m times n. If that process does not make sense, then I suggest you speak to an algebra tutor to figure out how that process works. Then you end up with this nice handy formula. This formula is going to be very useful for you when it comes to calculating the weighted mean, which we'll discuss in a little bit. So sum of x equals m times n. So then you can just plug in m and n, and you get the sum of x equals the m, 1.75, the mean, times the sample size, 8, and you still get 14. So I know I'm a lot more comfortable with just going straight to the sum of x equals m times n formula, plugging in what I have, and then figuring out the sum of x. Now what if you're given the sum of x and the mean, and you need to find the sample size? Well, you could start to plug in numbers and then play with the formula. So you start off with the mean formula, then you plug in what we have. We know the mean is 1.75 equals, we know that the sum of x is 14, divided by, we don't know what n is, so it just stays n. We multiply both sides by n. I like to get rid of the fractions first. So because we're dividing by n here, if we multiply both sides by n, it gets rid of the dividing the n here and just adds multiplying by n here. And we end up with 1.75 times n equals 14. Now, to get rid of this 1.75 so that we can isolate this n by itself, we need to divide both sides by 1.75. We're doing the opposite of what's happening here. This is multiplication. We do division to get rid of it. 
and we end up with n equals 14 divided by 1.75 equals 8. And 8 is the sample size. Just like before, there's a nice handy formula that you can use where we start with the mean formula and then we isolate n by itself. So we multiply both sides with n by n like we did up here to get m n equals sum of x. But that's not enough because we're trying to find n with this formula. So we want to isolate n. So to isolate n, we divide both sides by the mean. We end up with n equals the sum of x divided by the mean. And you'll see that you plug those numbers in and you get the same exact answer as before. So now I'm going to talk about the weighted mean. So sometimes it's necessary to combine two sets of scores, or three or four or five sets of scores, with different sample sizes. And you only have access to the statistics for each sample. In other words, you don't have access to the raw scores. You cannot simply add the means together, and you cannot even add the two means together and then divide by the two, or add up all the means together and divide by how many means you have. Or in other words, you know, find the average of the means. That will not give you an accurate weighted mean. To find the correct mean when combining samples with unequal sample sizes, or in other words, the weighted mean, you must account for differences of sample size. One mean is going to carry more weight than the other because it came from more scores. In other words, it was based on a larger sample. Computationally, that's accurate. You'll get the correct mean if you take into account how many scores were used to provide that mean, because what you're trying to do is find the total sum of all the scores and divide by how many scores you have. The only problem is that when you don't have access to the raw data, you don't really know what the sum of the scores is, but you can find that by taking the mean and multiplying it by the sample size for each sample. And that's the formula that we just derived over here. So here's an example of using the weighted mean. So let's say that I still have my sample of students from my Psych 210 class looking at how many semesters they've been at NSC for the sophomores. And then I also have some statistics from Dr. Marshall's Psych 210 class. And she has 10 students in her sample with a mean of four semesters at NSC among the sophomores. So we don't have access to the raw data here, but we can find out what the mean would be if we combined both of our samples into one. In other words, the weighted mean. So, if we look at this, we have the original formula, and then the formula that's broken down when you don't have access to the sum of x. So you just plug in what you have. And these little subscripts just represent the first sample and the second sample. Now, real quick, the weighted mean can be used for as many sets of scores as you have. If you had three sets of scores, you would just have m1 times n1, plus m2 times n2, plus m3 times n3, and then divided by n1 plus n2 plus n3, however many samples you have. But for our purposes, I'm only going to ask you to find the weighted mean for two sets of scores. So that's what our example looks like. So the mean for sample one, Dr. B's sample, and the sample size, 1.75 times 8. Then the mean for sample two, or Dr. Marshall's sample, and the sample size for Dr. Marshall's sample, 4 times 10. So then you plug in the sample size for both. Well, the first sample had 8, plus the second sample had 10, and then you just do the calculations. So 1.75 times 8 gives you 14, 4 times 10 gives you 40, 8 plus 10 gives you 18, and then you add the 14 plus 40 to get 54, and divide that by 18, and that's 3. So this final step, this is if we had all of the number of semesters for all 18 of the students in these, both of these samples, Add those up, it'd be 54, and there's 18 students in that combined sample. The weighted mean is 3. Now, it's important for you not to, like I mentioned before, just add the means together and say, oh, okay, well, this mean plus this mean gives you the final answer. That is not correct. Also, do not take the mean of the means. Don't say, oh, okay, well, I add these two together, and there's two sample means here, so I'll divide that by 2 and get the average. That is not correct. X those out. That's bad. You don't want to do that. Now, I will say that if you have equal sample sizes, taking the mean of the means will give you the correct answer. 
But just to err on the side of caution, anytime you're combining samples, just use the weighted mean formula. It's always correct, even if you have equal sample sizes. So now let's move on to the median. The median is just the midpoint. It separates the top 50% from the bottom 50% of scores. And when I say top versus bottom, I'm assuming that scores are placed in numeric order. So there's an index that you can use to locate which score in the order of numeric order represents your median. So that's called the median index. It's abbreviated as I. And you simply take the sample size or population size, if you're working with the population, and divide it by two. You're splitting it in half. So if you calculate I and you find that it's an, not an integer, in other words, it's not a whole number, it's a decimal. In other words, it's coming from an odd number of scores. If you have an odd number of scores, n divided by 2 will be a decimal. Then you have one single midpoint, and that represents your median. So you'll take n divided by 2. That'll tell you the position, i, of the score that's your median. And you will just round that up, and you'll have the median. So let's say that we had 11 scores. 11 divided by 2 is 5.5, round 5.5 up to 6, and then the 6th score, if you have your scores placed in or numeric order, the 6th score would be your median. Now let's see if we have an even number of scores. Well, then I will be an integer or a whole number. And in this case, you're going to have two midpoints or two scores that separate the top 50% from the bottom 50%. So to find the median index there, you need to, or to find the median there, you will need to take the ith score, so you'll take, still take n divided by 2, that'll be your first, the position of your first midpoint, then your next mid midpoint will be the next highest score, and then you'll just divide that by 2 to find the median. So the average of the two midpoints will give you the median when you have an even number of scores. And I'll show you a couple of examples. So here's an example where you just have the raw data. I'm also going to show you examples when you have a frequency distribution table. But for now, we'll just stick to raw data that's written out, and we have an odd number of scores. So at first, you're presented with data that's not in numeric order. But it's really important that you put it in numeric order so that that I, that median index, can be found, that, that score for the median index can be found. So I put the data in numeric order from highest to lowest. You can put it in order from lowest to highest. It doesn't matter as long as it's in order. And then I found my median index. So I have nine scores. Nine divided by two is 4.5. The fifth score is my median. There's four above and or four, four above and four below. So no matter which way you go about it, if I'm counting, okay, I'm looking for the fifth score. One, two, three, four, five, or one, two, three, four, five, I'm still going to arrive at the same number. Now it's important that you don't just stop there and say, oh, Five is my median. That is not your median. That's your median index. That tells you the position of the median within the set of data that's placed in numeric order. So be very careful with that. So the median is three, not five. Here's an example with more raw data, but I added a score to it so that now we have a sample size of 10, which is an even number. So we use the median index, n divided by two. 10 divided by two is five. So we need to look for the fifth and the sixth scores in the data set and find the average of those. So here's, you know, the ith score. We found it to be the fifth, the fifth plus one score, the sixth score. And we're going to find the average of the fifth and the sixth score. The fifth and the sixth score are four and three, no matter which way you go about finding it. So just to demonstrate again, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, or first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. No matter which way you go, you're going to arrive at the two middle scores, which are 4 and 3, not 5 and 6. That's the position of the two scores. So 4 plus 3, my two midpoints, divided by 2. 4 plus 3 is 7, divide that by 2, and we get 3.5 as the median. So the average of the two midpoints, or the mean of the two midpoints. And here you can see we have four sc scores above and four scores below the median. 
So here is an example using the frequency distribution. And this index is really useful when you're using a frequency distribution when you have a whole lot of data to count through. So median index, n divided by 2, there's 51 scores here. 51 divided by 2 is 25.5. Round up, 26. We're looking for the 26th score. Just like in the example before, it doesn't matter which end you start on, you're going to arrive at the same place if you're trying to find that location. So let's do it the hard way first. So first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth score, tenth score, twentieth score, twenty-fourth score, we're still not to twenty-six, twenty-fifth, twenty-sixth score is a one. Or I usually, if I'm using a frequency distribution table, I start at the end that has the highest frequency. So right here, you can see that the first 27 scores are a 1, if they're placed in numeric order. So the 26th score is a 1. No matter which way you go about finding it, you will see that the median is 1, there's 25 above, and 25 below a score of 1. Now, if you have an even number in your data set using the frequency distribution table. So I added another 10 to this data. So now we still use our median index, n divided by 2. Now n is 52, and 52 divided by 2 is 26. So the position of our median is the 26th and the 27th score, 26 and then the one above it. And we divide those two scores by 2, and we end up with still the 26th and 27th score is 1, and 1 plus 1 divided by 2 is 2 divided by 2 is 1, and that is our median. Still 25 above and 25 below 1. The mode is probably the simplest measure of central tendency to figure out. It really doesn't require any calculations. It's purely a visual thing. It's the score with the greatest frequency, or in other words, the most commonly occurring score in your data set. So there's two easy ways to find it. You can place your data in a frequency distribution table, and then just look down the F column and find the highest number or numbers in the F column. And whatever X value those correspond to are your modes. Or you can put your data into a frequency distribution graph and then just look for the tallest bars representing the most frequent scores. You can also have more than one mode, but unlike the median where you can have two midpoints and you find the average of the midpoints and the end result is a single number, for the mode you will actually have multiple numbers. You won't find the average of those numbers. Or you can just have one most frequently occurring score and then you won't have multiple modes. So let's look at a picture of that first frequency distribution table that I showed you looking at the number of semesters among a population of students, sophomore students at NSC. So there's a clear mode here, no matter which strategy that you use. If you look down the frequency column, you'll say, oh wow, there's a, definitely a mode here. 27 is much larger than the rest of these numbers. So what score represents 27 of the pieces of data? That's a 1. Do not get confused and go to the frequency column and find the largest number and then say, oh, 27 is the mode. It's not. 1 is the score that happens 27 times. 1 is the most frequent. Then when you place that in a graph, you will be able to see pretty quickly with this data, it's really straightforward, the tallest bar in this graph is represented by the 1 number of semesters. So mo the mode is 1. Now let's say that we had 26 students who had been here for three semesters. Well then we would also have another peak here and you could say that 3 and 1 are both a mode. Although 27 is technically more, if you have another score that happened you know, about the same number of times and it's a very high number, you can call that a mode as well. So. So far, you've learned about different scales of measurement, different shapes of distributions. Remember, normal, positive, negative, skew, bimodal. And now you've learned about measures of central tendency. All three of those things are important to understand so that you can 
di dictate which measure of central tendency is the most appropriate on a purely descriptive basis. So if you're just trying to accurately describe your data, which measure of central tendency should you use? And this decision, again, based on the scale of measurement and the shape of the distribution. So the mean is always our go-to. We want to use the mean because the mean uses every single score in the data set, so it is usually the most descriptive of the data. And once we talk about variability, you'll see that the mean is the reference point for variability. And variability is just a fancy word for the spread in scores, and we always talk about the spread in scores relative to the mean of all scores. So because of that, variability is one of the central principles that's used in inferential statistics, so the mean is pretty much always used in inferential statistics, even if we have data that's not appropriately described by the mean. So it's important for you to understand that on a purely descriptive level, if you're not doing inferential statistics, then you need to make the considerations I'm going to show you to decide which measure of central tendency is the most appropriate. So the mean is only appropriate when you have continuous data or an inter on an interval or ratio scale. It's important that you have continuous data because the mean is often a decimal. And remember, if you have discrete data, it can only be whole numbers. So a decimal doesn't really make sense. So it always bothers me when I see the census reports and it's like the average number of children in the United States is 2.7 or something like that. Well, you can't have a fraction of a child. So in that case, the mean would not be an appropriate way to describe that data. Now, you must be able to calculate the sum of x. So if you don't have access to the raw data, even if it's interval or ratio, but you don't have access to the raw data and you're limited with just a frequency distribution that's either open-ended or grouped, you can't calculate the sum of x and you can't find the mean because the sum of x is the numerator in the formula for the mean. So an open-ended distribution, like let's say instead of just saying how many semesters have you been at NSC and having them give me that number, I said, okay, answer this question. And I gave them a survey, said how many numbers have you been at NSC? One, two, three, four, or five plus. That would be an open-ended distribution. We don't know what five, the numbers for five plus are. They could have been here for five, six, seven, 20 semesters. They're still gonna mark that five plus. So it's hard to calculate the sum of x when you don't really have the full spectrum of all the scores in your data set. Then a grouped frequency distribution is discussed in your book in chapter two. We didn't go over it in the lecture or in class, but the grouped frequency distribution is used when you have a really, really, really large range of scores and it's not really appropriate to have a hundred rows, for instance, in your frequency distribution table to represent the full range of scores. So you can create different groups that you can summarize your scores with that way. So if we were looking at, you know, age of students at NSC, we have a pretty large range of ages. So you could just have different class intervals of, let's say, I don't know, 15 to 19 and 20 to 24 and 25 to 29, just different groups and then count how many people fit in each one of those groups. Well, in that case, you still don't have access to how many different ages are there specifically because it's in a grouped frequency distribution. You don't know how to find the sum of x, so you can't use the mean to describe data in a grouped frequency distribution either. Also, if your data passes the test, it's continuous, it's on an interval or ratio scale, if you don't have a normal distribution, then the mean can be very biased. And I'll show you some different distributions in a little bit and how the mean is affected when you have a skewed distribution especially. So outliers bias the mean towards them, and the mean is no longer very representative of the data. And remember, as I said before, your measure of central tendency is supposed to represent all the numbers in the data set. So if you have outliers that are biasing the mean, then that's a serious problem. So the median is the measure that you'd like to use. If you can't use the mean, then the next best thing is the median, because it actually, you know, considers the entire distribution of data sets, looking for the midpoint there. And it's appropriate when you have data on an interval, or sorry, an ordinal scale. So ordinal data tells you the direction, but not the distance of difference between scores. But there is still a numeric characteristic to the data. It can be placed in a meaningful order. So the median would be an appropriate measure there. 
then the grouped frequency distribution, you can go ahead and use the median. And it makes sense because you have the full range of scores represented. You just have them in groups. Then if you have data that's on an interval or ratio scale that has a skewed distribution, then that's when you would use the median. And I'll show you pictures of that here in a little bit. Using the mode. So the mode is really the least descriptive of all of the measures. It only accounts for the most frequently occurring scores, not all the scores in the data set. But you're left with the mode if you have discrete data that's on an interval or ratio data scale. If you have nominal data, so if you are looking at class standing, for instance, that's not ordinal interval or ratio. There's no numeric order that you can put it into. So the median and the mean would not make any sense. So in that case, you would just use the mode. And going back to discrete data really quick, when I mentioned the example of number of children, you that would technically be discrete on a ratio scale, and the mode would be most appropriate because it's a whole number always. And discrete data has to be a whole number. Okay, so talked about nominal data, and then open-ended distributions. So you're unsure what the largest number is, what the full range of data is in the data set when you have an open-ended distribution. So in the number of semesters example, if you have one, two, three, four, five plus, you don't know what the largest number of semesters is, so how can you find the midpoint and use the median? And we already know you can't calculate the sum of x and use the mean. Now, the book says that you can use the median for open-ended distributions, but that's really not the case. I would opt for the mode. Now, also, you want to use the mode when you have a bimodal distribution. So if you have a bimodal distribution, you'll report both of the modes that are in that data. If you have a trimodal distribution where you have three scores that are most frequently occurring, then you'll uh, report those three modes. But in this class, I'm only going to give you bimodal distributions. So here's an example of a ratio variable that the mean is not appropriate for. It's continuous, it's ratio, but the shape is definitely not normal. This is a very positively skewed shaped distribution. So, the remember, again, the whole point of central tendency is to find a score or scores that represent all the numbers in the data set. Well, one is clearly the most representative number of the data set. That's where most of the scores are falling. And if you remember, that was our mode and our median. But our mean, when we calculated that, was 2.471. And that grossly overestimates the true trend in the data, the number of semesters that students had been attending NSC. And the reason that it overestimates that is because we have outliers on the high end here that attended uh, 10 semesters and a couple that attended seven semesters. So the mean gets drugged towards that. It gets pulled towards that high score. And now it's no longer an accurate representation of the data. So just to show you some shapes of data and then reiterate which different type of measure central tendency is most appropriate. And I just want to point out that if you have nominal data, you use the mode. If you have ordinal data, you use the median. Shape is only a consideration when you have interval or ratio data, and then you need to make some decisions based on the shape. So here, this is a distribution looking at weight, and let's say, you know, how many adults in the population, let's say this is in terms of millions, uh, have this specific weight. So weight is a normally distributed variable for the most part. Most people fall around the middle, and then you have some serious extremes on either end. Whenever you have a normal distribution, your mean, median, your, and your mode are identical. If you have an approximately normal distribution, then your mean, median, and mode will be very close together. So if you have a mean, median, and mode that are pretty similar, then you'll know that you have at least a somewhat normal distribution. If they're identical, you'll know you have a true normal distribution. And if you have a normal distribution, like I said before, interval or ratio data, normally distributed, the mean is the most appropriate measure of central tendency. Here's a negatively skewed distribution. And this is actually pretty close to what the distribution of my grades looked like in Psych 210 last semester. Lots of good grades, and then some outliers on the very low end. So in this case, you'll want to use the median. 
This is data that's on a ratio scale, but it's very skewed, so you would want to use the median for that. And grade is not discrete, it is continuous. And as you can see again with the skew, the low end of the distribution, those outliers on the low end, are biasing the mean towards them, making the mean lower than the true representation of the data. Here's a distribution looking at the age of drivers and the number of crashes in 2013. And this is based off some rough, rough estimate of some data that I looked at in the past. And you'll see here that the younger drivers have a whole lot more accidents than all the other drivers that as they age, as the age increases. This is a positively skewed distribution. Most of the accidents fall in the young age group, and then it tapers off as you go to the higher ages. So the mean, again, is getting drug out towards that tail of the distribution. Those outliers are biasing the mean towards it, and the median is the most appropriate representation of the data, and then the mode is still the high point. So this example demonstrates a bimodal distribution and maybe helps you be a little bit more critical consumer of research. So both these graphs are looking at the age of driver and crashes or car accidents. This one is not controlling for the fact that there are probably more younger drivers on the road than very elderly drivers on the road. This one does control for that. So here, of course, there's more young people having accidents than the elderly because there are a few elderly people driving on the road. Whereas this controls for the difference in just how much they're driving, and you see a clear bimodal distribution here, where most of the accidents are happening among the very young drivers and the very old drivers. And in this case, the mode would be the most appropriate measure of central tendency, and then the mean and the median would fall somewhere in the middle. But it would be very misleading if you said, yeah, the mean number of, or the mean age of drivers having crashes is 49. Well, that's a gross misrepresentation of the data. You would think, oh, wow, those middle-aged drivers are having a whole lot of accidents, when in reality, it's the very old and the very young. So you have to be really careful when you hear statistics thrown at you. You have to think about, well, what's the shape of that distribution? Is the mean actually an appropriate measure? So I hope you are well prepared to complete your knowledge check and then your practice problems in class. And I hope you really understand measures of central tendency and when different types of measures of central tendency are appropriate for describing data.